Okay, let's get started. Um, as you know, I usually, or when I'm here, introduce the speaker. But since I'm the speaker today, <laughs> and you all know me, at least most of you do, um, I guess I'll just go ahead and start. I, I guess for, um, I maybe recognize, maybe don't recognize one or two faces in the crowd. So um, my name's Bill Hirsch. I'm the um, uh, chair of the uh, department and also uh, director of the program. And um, most years I kick off the conference uh, series, um, oftentimes kind of giving an update of what's happening in the field. And that, that's actually sort of what this is. But I'm, I'm going to shift the focus a little bit um, to focus just on the educational program. Um, there's obviously a lot of other exciting things happening in informatics. Um, but I'm going to focus on um, the educational program, in part, um, because as you know, we sometimes use this conference for practice talks. And there is actually an educators collaborative that um, uh, has been formed in the School of Medicine. And they have a grand round series. And so they, um, um, they were looking for speakers. So I volunteered to speak. Always want to talk about our program. And um, <clears throat> so I'm actually giving that talk next week, which will largely be these slides. But um, what I'm actually going to do, though, is um, some of the things that will be clear um, review to you all, I will go through very quickly. And then what I'd like to do is to leave a little time at the end and um, get some feedback, not only about the talk, but um, the program, if there's any issues people want to bring up. Um, let me then also ask um, someone to monitor the Twitter feed, the DMICE-COMP Twitter feed, because there's potentially people listening out there. And we like to take questions that way um, in addition to from the audience. And, and when we do the questions now, we're getting away from these awful mics. And so um, I think Lynn has the uh, microphone, uh, the, the purpose of which is so people um, who are either uh, listening into the webinar or um, listening later can actually hear the questions. Um, <clears throat> so this talk, um, as you know, um, once a month we uh, call this conference, in addition to the DMICE Research Conference, the um, uh, Clinical Informatics Grand Rounds, um, which actually is uh, related to our Clinical Informatics Fellowship and actually enables uh, physicians to get continuing medical education credit. So people have to um, make a statement of any disclosures, stock that they own, and so forth. So I'm uh, happy to report that I have no relevant financial or commercial interests or disclosures to report. Although actually, I probably do have a conflict of interest here, because I get paid to teach informatics. That's what I do for a living. Um, but technically, that's not a conflict of interest. So anyways, um, in, when we do grand rounds, we also have to present learning objectives. So this is a um, kind of longer version of the table of contents for my talk. So um, the part I'm really going to go fast through, because you probably don't want to hear me talk about it, is uh, defining our field. Um, I will talk about some of the competencies that have been developed for various types of informaticians. Um, I'll talk about the accomplishments of the program, which many of you know. Many of you are part of those accomplishments. Um, and then uh, describe what I think are some of the lessons that uh, we've learned from this whole experience uh, literally over a quarter century um, since we uh, first uh, had our NLM training grant awarded in 1992 when I was a young assistant professor. Um, <clears throat> OK, so again, I, I'm going to go through these quickly because many of you have seen these slides. But I think you all know my view of informatics, of the intersection of people, information, and technology. Um, we have a lot of adjectives that we put in front of informatics. Uh, depending on whether we're talking about informatics about genomes or people or populations or images, et cetera. Um, and um, I think that's OK, although sometimes uh, it creates conflict um, when we're uh, trying to 
more precisely define the field. Um, <clears throat> informatics uh, has become a core competency of um, healthcare. The uh, Institute of Medicine, now called the National Academy of Medicine, uh, published a report in 2003 on um, the uh, the competence that health professionals need to provide patient-centered care, and one of the circles leading to that Venn diagram is utilize informatics. Um, informatics competencies uh, are not just computer literacy. It's kind of a battle that I have fought over the years, scars to show for it, um, explaining to people that informatics is just not about computers. Um, obviously, even though um, we enjoy working with computers, but it's really about the information. And in fact, um, there, well, we, we, for example, with uh, medical students, we know that they come in, they all are very computer savvy, um, email, messaging, face, Facebook, etc. cetera. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're good information users. Um, and I, I suppose we can actually say that about informatics students too. Um, so um, we need to teach good information skills. Informatics is also part of, um, more recently, this notion of a third science. So the traditional two sciences of medicine are basic science and clinical science. The uh, recent years have kind of coalesced this idea of a third science about, um, it was originally called healthcare delivery science, which, which I actually like that term, but um, for whatever reason, um, it's now called health system science. Um, just the idea that um, medicine, healthcare are more than just biology and clinical. It's really about um, systems, how you deliver care, the quality of care that you deliver, cost effectiveness, et cetera. Um, and informatics is listed as one of the core um, uh, domains of health system science. There's actually a book that's been published, and I was asked to write the informatics chapter um, in that book. And so um, that's another way to look at informatics. Informatics is also um, important for physicians. Um, as you all know, it's now a subspecialty of all specialties. Um, there's four, over 1,400 board certified physicians, including a few of us in this room. Um, we also have a new fellowship. I'll actually mention that in a little bit. Um, and um, I think e even though there's actually some issues, I actually think it's been a good development for the informatics field. But informatics is not just about physicians. There are many others who work in informatics coming from other health professions, life sciences, IT, et cetera. And, um, <clears throat> In fact, uh, AMIA is developing a advanced health informatics certification, although there's some issues around it, who's going to be eligible for it. But the point is that informatics is about more than uh, physicians. And um, informaticians re really play a role now across the um, healthcare enterprise, whether it's uh, academia, research, healthcare delivery, et cetera. Um, I, I think we've kind of reached the point now where most people in healthcare know what informatics is, though there's still occasionally confusion there. Um, this part you may be less familiar with, um, but another thing that's happened in the field is the defining of competencies. Uh, it's actually something that's happened in education um, rather than just think we need to have people um, memorize some body of knowledge. We actually want to determine what they need to do to function in their um, workforce roles, uh, whether they're professionals or researchers or educators or whatever. So there have been the development of um, <clears throat> competency sets for different types of, in, well, for for informaticians, but also for, you'll see one set, which we actually uh, uh, developed and are known for here, actually for medical students, although in reality it's applicable 
to um, pretty much all health professions. So um, there's a lot of uh, text on these slides, and my goal, e even with the audience next week, is not to read through them all, but to just show you the competency sets, but to um, really look at it from the standpoint of the big picture. And um, uh, I have references. Actually, I um, uh, will uh, distribute these slides around for those who want to look at them. But one set of competencies is the core competencies for biomedical informatics that was developed by AMIA and published in 2012. Um, this set of competencies actually applies to most of us in this room who do informatics. And it's, I, I like this set of, com I, I like all these set of competencies actually, but I like this one because it really describes what we do as informaticians. We don't just um, go in and install software and hope that it'll work or think that it's going to work. But we, um, first of all, we acquire the professional perspective in informatics and in that we, there, I believe that there really is a, an informatics way of looking at information related problems. Keeping in mind, and, and this is true whether you're in bioinformatics or clinical informatics, but keeping in mind the importance of information, of standards, of people's workflow, um, security. I actually just met this morning with the new uh, chief information security officer who I'm going to have come here and, and give us a talk. He's a very interesting uh, person and um, will hopefully usher in a new era of security. But as informaticians, we think about these things. We don't think about workarounds and um, do the brilliant thing that our surgical residents who um, didn't really know better, but when the EPIC um, patient sign-out tool was um, not meeting their needs, they just uh, created a Google Doc and thousands of OHSU patients sitting in an unsecure Google Doc, which is one of, actually one of the reasons why that Chief Information Security Officer is here because of our HIPAA fine. Anyways, but the point is um, to acquire that professional perspective, point of view, to analyze people's problems so understand what it is that they want to do and bring our perspective on the different types of data and information that people use, um, produce solutions for them, um, implement them, evaluate them, refine them, and um, in the process innovating and collaborating and um, sharing our um, results with the rest of the world. So that's one set of competencies. Um, the, in the development of the clinical informatics subspecialty, which really represents um, the um, informatics becoming a um, more of a professional role. Um, when some of us in the room here who are older came into the field, there really wasn't much of an, a professional role for informatics. Most informaticians were um, academic researchers. What's really happened over the last 10 or 15 years is the huge growth of um, mostly in healthcare organizations, but also in research organizations of um, informatics professionals who really have a professional role. Um, and again, I won't go through all the details here, but it's a similar sort of thing of um, being able to do things like uh, a, an information needs analysis, coming up with the solution. In the case of informatics professionals, since you're often um, buying versus building software, uh, being able to issue, um, be involved in the issuing of RFPs to uh, evaluate uh, vendor um, responses to those sorts of things, and implementing uh, commercial software like we do um, in the hospital now with Epic and, and all the other um, operational systems. Um, also being able, though, to evaluate and um, generalize the findings. So this one is the, um, comes from the paper that uh, our group here published around competencies. It was written for medical students, but, and, and it was written 
for medical students because it was funded by a grant that was for medical students and uh, was published in a medical education journal. But in reality, these competencies are really what every healthcare professional who's practicing medicine, nursing, pharmacy, physical therapy, et cetera, uh, in the 21st century re needs to know. And we, it, we titled it, um, since a lot of people think, well, um, healthcare professionals, they need to use the EHR, they need to know how to search, um, but they need to know more. And, and so while those two things are most prominent right at the beginning, there is other things. Um, in the clinical setting, um, clinicians need to understand what clinical decision support is and does, um, how they can be involved in tailoring it for their um, organization, um, understanding things like uh, population health management as we move towards value-based care and medicine, uh, protecting patient privacy and security, uh, understanding the, um, the, the importance of that, the ramifications of it, um, trying to not have people do workarounds, um, patient safety, uh, quality manage measurement and improvement, uh, health information exchange, understand why um, we still haven't reached the point where um, you're a patient somewhere and you go get care somewhere else and your information seamlessly goes there or in the case often now doesn't go there. Um, professionalism, the whole um, uh, how we uh, act as professionals with information, how we uh, behave on social media, uh, which sometimes my children accuse me of overstepping bounds. Um, uh, all the patient engagement, personal health records, uh, um, research, telemedicine, things like that. So that's this set of competencies. Um, and then there's also a set of competencies for researchers. And um, I actually just, I, I didn't find a way to incorporate it in, um, but I just came across it a few days ago, actually a paper on bioinformatics competencies for undergraduates. Um, I'll have to work that into this one. But um, this uh, comes mostly out of the CTSA program. And I was a little bit involved in this um, in terms of what, what do researchers need to know? Um, researchers need to know, for example, that they shouldn't be carrying around their PHI data on an unencrypted thumb drive, which unfortunately happens. They um, need to understand um, the value and but the limitations of things like clinical data sources that they have access to, um, integrating uh, omics data with clinical data, et cetera. Um, they will rely on people like us as professionals to help them do that, but they have to have at least a basic understanding of what they can and can't do with information. So um, let me run through all the great accomplishments, which you all know about because you're part of, but um, uh, maybe summarize it all because some of you may be in parts of the program where you're not as aware of what's happening in the rest of the program, but um, we've done a lot over the years, and um, you know, OHSU is certainly known uh, in this area. And um, so, obviously, our graduate program uh, right now, consisting of our PhD and two masters and graduate certificate, it's been around a while. I've written about it. Other people have written about it, um, and. Um, it's uh, offered in different modalities on the, in the clinical informatics track. It's offered um, online for the graduate certificate, the MBI, and it can be done for the MS. Um, we're actually, uh, some of you know about this, in the process of, of making some name and other structural changes. And we stepped into a hornet's nest of um, uh, things that needed to get approved, so we um, are um, in the process, believe it or not, of going through the whole program approval process that I actually first went through with the master's program 22 years ago. Um, and um, But we're confident that we'll 
uh, make it out of that. Actually, Diane has put a, a ton of effort, Andrea as well. Um, and uh, hopefully, um, uh, in the next, after several months, this will all be behind us. What, what, what do we, well, it all started because we just wanted to make some name changes in the tracks. Um, clinical informatics, broadening it to call it health and clinical informatics, uh, BCB, um, changing the word biology to biomedicine to kind of reflect the more data science orientation of the BCB track. And, um, and it's not just about biology and omics anymore. It has clinical data, imaging, et cetera. Uh, when we did that, the, uh, the provost's office actually decided that the tracks had actually become distinct from each other. And in fact, there's this whole movement in education away from using the word tracks. So um, it, about six or nine months from now, you'll hear us talk about majors. Some of you will be BCB majors. Others of you will be health and clinical informatics majors. And um, we, we also um, wanted to take the, as long as we were making changes, um, no one really knows what an MBI is. Um, although, actually, I mean, there's so many people that have it that you, you see them. But we're, we're the only place, I think, that has a degree called MBI. Anyways, we, um, we did that because in the old days, if you didn't do a thesis, people didn't want to call it a master of science. Well, now the world has changed, and any master's degree can be called a master of science. So we'll soon be master of science with thesis and master of science without thesis. So that's what you'll be able to call your degrees. Um, anyways, uh, so we're working on this, and we'll let you know when it happens. Um, our numbers uh, continue to go up. We, as of June, now have awarded 738 degrees and certificates to 666 people. Some people have more than one. Some people like to collect them. Um, and we have many international collaborations, both um, international students who come here and students to whom we deliver education. So um, last week I was in Thailand, and our, um, the, was uh, teaching a group of students who had basically done the equivalent of BMI 510 online delivered on Sakai to Thailand. We delivered it to Singapore and everywhere else around the world. Um, and our students live all over the place. Uh, uh, depending on the audience, I always like to point out that most of the cities of the NLM training grant sites are, have dots on that map. Those dots um, are where uh, our online students live, or at least uh, a few years ago. We probably need to update this. Um, we have our fellowship programs, which many of you in the room are um, involved with. We just got re-upped for our NLM training grant. Uh, unfortunately, they um, wanted to increase the number of programs, so they reduced the number of slots. Fortunately, um, gave us enough slots to cover all of the existing students. That would have been uh, a tragedy, but it didn't happen. So now we have um, nine pre-doc and four post-doc slots steady state. Many of you rotate into them, rotate out of them. Um, and just like in the last cycle, the National Institute for Dental and Cranial Facial Research funded um, some slots. In this round, the National Institute for Environmental and Health Science, Sciences funded two slots. So um, some of you are in those slots. So that's um, one fellowship, and we're now in year um, year 26 of the grant. If you ever look at the the um, identifiers that NIH gives for grants, it, it has the identifier usually in our case LM, stands for Library of Medicine, and then Dash. And if you're in the first year of your grant, like Michelle, it's Dash 01, and in the case of this, is Dash 26. Um, we also have another. Um, fellowship that we have uh, created for the clinical informatics subspecialty. Again, it's we were at the forefront. We were the fourth program uh, accredited. Um, Vishnu 
did all the work to make sure that happened. Um, and in fact, um, our friend Chris Longhurst uh, wrote a paper about the experience of the first four programs, which we were part of. Um, what's another interesting thing with the fellowship is that the, the online courses are actually very amenable to the fellowship. And so there are about a half dozen other clinical informatics fellowships from other places uh, who are employing our online courses. And so um, they take our courses, um, interact with our, not, not only our clinical informatics fellows, but also our um, uh, other students. And, and one thing I've aimed for in all of this was um, um, one family of um, informatics education. And people's backgrounds and interests and career goals are very different, but um, I've always thought there would be value of, of um, having people together, certainly uh, taking courses as much as possible. Um, <clears throat> so, and then um, we have, um, we, it's like a lot of things. We sort of stumbled into it and it actually turned out to be a huge thing. Uh, back in 1999, when many people accessed the internet with a telephone modem, um, people would be asking us, you know, could you put your courses online? So we actually, um, kind of as a little experiment, uh, must have been the summer of 99, um, I had ex actually hired one of our master's students and she helped me put VMI 510 online and we taught it that fall. And, um, uh, you know, the internet was a lot different then. Uh, at, at least half, maybe two thirds of the people connected by, um, you know, 2400 baud or whatever the, I, I get 56k baud modems and things like that. So we had to be very cognizant about um, bandwidth. Um, and, um, but it was successful and um, people wanted more. So that's why we actually created the graduate certificate program. We didn't actually think that people would want a master's degree. Um, but they did, so then we um, put the clinical informatics track master's degree online, and um, um, maybe the rest is, is history. Um, but that did uh, lead us to the, develop the certificate, the, the eight course subset of the masters, and then um, this, this was also at a time when uh, people were starting to develop professional master's degrees. It, it was recognized in many fields that people wanted the knowledge of the master's degree but didn't necessarily want to do a long research project. And in fact, we had a number of students who were phenomenally bright but um, for whatever reason not really researchers. And um, it really provided them an opportunity to learn more about informatics um, than um, uh, and, and to not have to do a long research project. We did decide with the master's program that if we were going to award a master's degree, they should spend some time on our campus. And we had had some experience with other programs of, of um, crunching, uh, it's actually one of the advantages to the quarter system, kind of crunching a quarter uh, program down to um, basically a week. So as you all know, um, over the summer now, we usually teach several courses. Um, in fact, even the BCB track has a short course, uh, the, the analytics course with the folks from Kaiser, although it's actually both tracks. Um, <clears throat> an another thing uh, that's happened um, is the 10 by 10 program, uh, which has also uh, achieved success in its own right. Uh, what happened was uh, AMIA was looking for online learning experiences and they were able to find a lot of people who wanted to charge them a lot of money for a small amount of content. BMI 510 was already online. It was um, sort of a perfect storm. And so I said, you know, let me make a proposal. And, and we did and, um, you know, basically repackaged BMI 510 as a standalone um, introductory course. And um, <clears throat> at the time, some of you know Charlie Safran, who was president of AMIA was going around saying, we need, 
one physician and one nurse in every hospital trained in informatics. So there's 6,000 hospitals in the U.S. So um, I came up with the idea, well, let's train 10,000 by 2010. So 10 by 10 is where that name comes from. And then um, a couple other things happened. A number of people wanted um, further study. In fact, about 15 or 20 percent of people who do 10 by 10 actually enroll in our master's program. And even uh, some of you know Paula Otero from Buenos Aires um, took the course and translated it into Spanish. Although since then it's become very tailored uh, to Latin America, uh, but initially was a was pretty much a direct translation, and so she's been very uh, successful with that. Um, and actually, uh, we we actually trained about a, a thousand people by 2010. But there was still interest, and there continues to be interest to this day. So it just kind of goes on as 10 by 10, even though it's already seven years later. Um, and it's um, it's been a great program. Uh, the program we've also been awarded other. Grants. We actually got a training grant from NIH. Um, some of you remember our Argentine uh, fellows, um, Alfredo and Charlie and Sonia. Um, they're all doing great things. Al Alfredo's working for Inner Systems, uh, and um, most uh, Damian Borbola now is a faculty member at University of Utah. So that that's been a successful program. Uh, we got the large amount of money from the high tech grant, the stimulus uh, dollars. Um, more recently, the BD2K, and then uh, updating the uh, health IT curriculum. <clears throat> uh, we've also several in this room. I see Vish. I don't think I see Paul, but um, we, we've actually. Um, I kind of liken it to we. Um, for, actually, back in the 90s, I tried to convince the powers that be in the School of Medicine, you know, we should teach some of this stuff to medical students. And it was sort of like wandering around the desert. And then um, George Maicano, some of you know George, who's our Senior Associate Dean for Education, um, led us into the promised land. Um, although, fortunately, I wasn't Moses, so I didn't have to, like, not get to go into the promised land. But anyways, um, we, um, we've actually quickly become, uh, and I, I can say this with a straight face. Uh, we have more clinical informatics now in our MD curriculum than probably any other program in the country. It's also been facilitated by the AMA grant that um, uh, funded some of the work. And we've developed a lot of activities for medical students, though, it really at their kinds of competencies. So um, our medical students, well, or I should say the average medical student um, doesn't need to implement machine learning algorithms or um, uh, develop fire queries and things like that. But they, they need to know how to use informatics tools in their um, care. And we've developed a lot of different modalities. Um, actually, Gretchen has uh, also been heavily involved with that um, to uh, do various things. and. Um, being good academics, we've written about it. it. It's got my name there, but there's actually seven or eight of us couldn't fit them all um, on the line. But uh, I wrote a chapter uh, describing everything that we've done. Um, one thing we learned, I had actually forgotten from my medical education, is medical students only study stuff that's on the test. And we didn't actually create much assessment at the beginning, so they didn't do our stuff because it wasn't on the test. Um, anyways, uh, so we got stuff on the test now, and so uh, they're, they're doing informatics. <clears throat> we, we've also been involved with other learners. We have students from the HIP program, the Human Investigations program. Um, we actually, um, the, the BD2K um, educational materials around data science, uh, we, we, some of those modules are mapped to some of those competencies for clinical and translational researchers. We've also been involved, there, there's this process going on, it won't impact most of you in the room, but to uh, transform PhD education in the School of Medicine. You may have heard a little bit about it called Creative Ideas. It, it's still at least a year down the road, so it won't impact um, you all much. But it, it will actually potentially bring us closer to and more aligned with the rest of the PhD programs. But 
Um, right, right now, we're involved in the planning process. And we also have our um, uh, articulation with Portland State, the um, 3 plus 2 program that if one hits the ground running at Portland State, um, can basically get a bachelor's degree and a master's degree in five years. And we, the, the relatively few um, uh, students have, have actually completed that, but um, uh, the option is there. And, and I, I'm hoping it will grow to include other majors, other undergraduate majors. Um, so what have we learned in all this? So this is my kind of uh, take on it. I've been, over the last few weeks, as I've put these slides together, trying to kind of categorize and summarize the kind of lessons learned. And so actually this part, I'd be interested in getting um, some feedback. And I'm, I think I'm doing pretty well, so I will um, leave plenty of time for that. So, um, so I, I kind of, as I thought about it, broke it down into students and sort of technology and modalities of learning and then issues around the program and support. So students, we, we've certainly seen a shift in um, informatics from, as I've already said, formerly a mostly academic undertaking, but now um, many professionals, kind of exemplified by the work that goes on in, in clinical informatics and in clinical settings, um, who, where it, it's really, if, if they're doing their job well, taking and applying informatics. Um, and then part of, the, part of that's due to the shift that we've seen of um, in, in the early days of the field, the, the real big programs were those that had developed their homegrown EHRs. And as many of you know, uh, one by one, um, those systems are uh, being replaced, uh, mostly by EPIC. And, um, you know, Vanderbilt now, uh, Partners, um, uh, heck, even the, the VA is um, planning, probably unfortunately, because it's so widespread and supported, but uh, swapping out Vista for Cerner, for better or worse. So that's been a change in the field. <clears throat> um, one thing that we've always experienced in this program is really two kind of distinct, well, not distinct, it's probably more of a continuum, but uh, categories of learners, the um, kind of first career people who are relatively recent, maybe haven't finished their primary training, um, as opposed to, especially in the clinical side, although s somewhat a few in BCB, who um, uh, mid-career uh, transitioning into informatics. And, um, and, and the Oftentimes, those who are transitioning in mid-career have jobs, have families. I think that's part of the reason for the success of the distance learning is that um, people don't need to pick up and um, move to Portland and become a full-time student. They can access it remotely. A another interesting finding that I didn't really think about initially, but I, I chuckle when I see it. You know, we've created this virtual community. Um, I often see our online students, um, uh, well, may, maybe like at conferences, hanging out together, but um, networking with each other, uh, keeping track of each other, and two times, at least I know, is that marriages. <laughs> um, some of you remember Darren Nicholson and Michelle Lee, and I'm trying to remember the other one now. I can't, but anyways, uh, so we've uh, facilitated a lot of relationships. <laughs> um, then, then another thing that we th this has actually been a challenge for the clinical track is um, actually getting people to come to class we can't seem to do that anymore we, um, we were able to do it a little bit when we got all of the high tech funding and we had a lot of on campus master's students but um, we find um, many of you um, uh, actually prefer to um, take, um, uh, to, to listen to me talk from the comfort of your own home as opposed to um, having me stand up in front of you like this. So um, anyways, that, that's been a challenge and I, I think that's just the reality of education. Um, and um, uh, the, although the thing is, with, I, I think we found with distance learning that 
pretty much every, anything that one needs to do can be done remotely. I have Skype calls with online students. I, um, they work on projects and things like that. There, there's probably some difference to sitting across the table from someone and working on something, but um, we've certainly found um, uh, Joan used to use virtual projects, um, which I guess it got sidetracked because of time zone differences and things like that. Um, but you can certainly do a lot that way. Um, it, in terms of the technology and teaching modalities, again, I, I think pretty much everything uh, you can do in a classroom uh, can be replicated, at least in informatics. You know, maybe, maybe not in learning a, a, a real hands-on skill like, say, surgery. But um, I'll talk a little bit about lectures, interaction, assessment. And I actually have to mention, I don't see any of our Sakai folks here, but the, the quality of support has, has really improved uh, over the years and has, has also helped. Um, so we've been using uh, voice over PowerPoint lectures literally since the beginning. I mean, that's how I got started in it. Um, some of you may remember real media. Um, that's uh, kind of gone by the wayside. But um, other tools, and, and we currently mostly use Articulate Presenter. And, and actually, you, there's another big push in education for active learning. Um, the, the idea of students being more engaged. And you might say, well, how, how can passively listening to a lecture uh, more engage people? Well, when you chunk it into smaller segments, um, when you let people start and stop, um, you, there's even ways to interact with, uh, to make online learning interactive. You can introduce some active learning uh, kinds of technique as opposed to a lecture where I'm just sitting here, standing here talking, and if your mind wanders onto something else, which I'm sure it will, I usually do too, um, you may miss, have missed something that I said. Um, so <laughs> I actually have a screenshot of, this is, you know, my famous slide about information retrieval. <laughs> this is uh, whenever it was, probably like in 1999 or so. And this is uh, uh, what I captured a uh, screenshot of a few days ago. It, there are some differences, although the content is the same. So how far have we come? Another nice thing about Articulate Presenter is that you can, well, actually you can record it slide by slide, but you can also listen to it slide by slide. So you can navigate around and go back and things like that. Um, in fact, um, you know, certainly I've spent a lot of my time, a lot of my life in the last, I guess, almost two decades uh, in front of these sorts of tools. And, and Articulate Presenter, is pretty good, and, and my purpose in putting this up here as I will uh, deliver this talk to the educators next week is to just, um, uh, many of them are interested in these sorts of tools, and, and many of you might be too. Um, there, right now, I'm not aware, I'm, I'm constantly on the lookout, and I would change in a minute if something better came along, but um, Articulate uh, Presenter is probably the best tool available. It works as a plug-in to Windows PowerPoint, um, it, a, a real nice feature of it is you can narrate one slide at a time. So if something changes on one slide, you don't have to re-record your whole lecture. Um, students notice it that the background noise might change or things like that, but um, um, it, it makes it easier to update things. And <clears throat> um, it used to have the problem of only outputting flash, um, but now it outputs uh, HTML5, you can create MP3, uh, files and so forth, and, and it works relatively well on mobile devices. Um, the cons is that it's a, it's a pretty expensive product, um, although um, in the larger scheme of things, it's, um, uh, you know, when you look at all the other expenses the program has, including salaries of people, um, it's, it's relatively small. Um, and then, of course, as you know, many of us are Mac users. It doesn't. There's no native Mac version, so um, I, you know, fire up my uh, Parallels uh, virtual machine and bring up now Windows 10 on my new Mac, and I uh, use uh, Articulate Presenter that way. And and it's a little clunky, um, but it, it, it works. Um, so um, there's also um, We've learned to interact well in, with online classes, uh, the you know, classic threaded discussion forums, which um, 
if you can keep people from flaming and and otherwise being unprofessional work pretty well. Um, we ha had the, have had the ability to do real-time video. I haven't made a huge use of it, but I know some of the other faculty have. And OHSU is transitioning to this new um, Nexus, which is based on Cisco meeting. Um, and then the virtual projects, which I, I always thought were um, an interesting idea to enable students to work together. Um, assessment, uh, I, I have to say that uh, our informatics students aren't quite as uh, not studying something because it's not on the test. But assessment is important. We have to make sure that you gain the knowledge, the competencies. A again, um, many things can be done online. Um, another interesting thing is um, I was once a medical student, and the, the bane of medical students is multiple choice questions. And I swore that I would never, if I ever taught, I would never use multiple choice questions. I love multiple choice questions. They're, they're actually an effective way to um, uh, test people. In fact, I, I often found with short answer questions that it, it was a kind of rote memory thing. So I, I personally like multiple choice questions. And then, of course, we have the issue of um, high stakes exams. Um, uh, unfortunately, um, not everyone upholds the code of, of honor of these sorts of things. And so uh, some challenges with uh, virtual proctoring, as some of you have experienced with Examity. So a few comments about the program. And then actually, then I'll wrap it up. Um, I've, I've learned. Um, well, this is true with the department and also with the academic program. It's, it's a business. Um, it, it's a noble business, but it's a business nonetheless. And we have to make sure that um, the kind of business aspects of the program are tended to. Um, the Sakai folks uh, over the years have been wonderful. My initial hesitation when we, we actually used to run a server back, back when Blackboard was actually much cheaper. We used to have a Unix server that was running Blackboard. And um, when Sakai came, I was really hesitant because um, there's a history at this institution of IT um, things being less than optimally supported. Um, but the, Tom Boudreau, who's now retired, but was the original head of the Sakai group, and he did a tremendous job. Um, we've also learned that responding to students, um, even folks such as yourself who are on campus here, but the online students, uh, e even if it's just a response to tell them that you will get back to them, just to acknowledge that they're there. It's, uh, I mean, I cer certainly find this in other things of what I do. When you send an email and then you don't hear back after um, days, weeks, whatever, um, I, I actually have a paper that's sitting under review at a journal, and I haven't heard anything in five months, although I've queried them a few times. It's kind of frustrating. So just you know, being timely in your responses to, to people. In fact, we have a policy, um, you all should know, that in fact, this applies to all faculty, not just online faculty, that um, we have an initial response back to students in, within two business days of when the email was received. Um, a few other lessons I've learned. Um, I live a very asynchronous life. Uh, all of the teaching I do is asynchronous, you know, so I, I don't have to find, if I'm traveling, I don't have to find a substitute. Um, on the other hand, um, oftentimes the first thing I do, like when I got to Thailand last week, check my email, check my Sakai. Um, it's uh, what I call living the asynchronous life. Um, that human connection to learners is still really important. Um, uh, the technology is an enabler. It's not really a replacement for um, human contact. Um, one interesting thing is that uh, OHSU success um, from all of you in informatics uh, education <laughs> is being replicated by many people. In fact, um, the, with the Clinical Informatics Fellowships, uh, Vanderbilt uh, is now um, uh, asking programs, you know, you can take courses with us. Um, and then also facing competition from other new types of education like MOOCs. I, um, um, I, I think MOOCs are interesting, uh, massive open online courses. They, I never really 
thought they would replace higher education. There, there's certainly, uh, I mean, there's certainly tons of great content out there, but um, education is more than just delivering lectures, as we've learned in this program. So, um, the um, I, I think the the place for MOOCs is still kind of working its way out. So, um, in conclusion, um, I think uh, we all um, should be proud of the success that we've achieved in um, uh, making the making the world a better place for informatics, and um, uh, not not only for informatics professionals, but disseminating to larger the larger public. Um, the technology is important. It's like everything in informatics. The technology is important, but um, understanding the needs, the in the case of education, competencies, delivering content, um, managing the program, and um, again for the uh, folks that I talk to next week, because one one of the challenges in academia is is how to um, achieve the productivity or the fruits of, of ac academic success. Grants, writing papers, things like that. Um, I, I think we've shown uh, that we do that quite well. Um, many of us have published papers and so forth and uh, managed to, to get a few grants along the way. Um, so this is my last slide. I'm just going to leave this up here um, asking anything you want to talk about. We have about 10, 10 or so minutes left. Um, anything, any comments on the slides? Um, anything you, comments, suggestions, constructive criticisms about the program, or anything I didn't talk about that faculty should really be thinking about um, have added. And actually, I'm going to join the beginning of the fellows meeting um, and uh, talk about those things there. So uh, Lynn has the microphone, uh, so you don't have to push. And Ani has his hand up. Oh, and then Mike. <laughs> So I think we kind of talked about this a little bit, Bill, but I'd just like to hear your thoughts again. Um, when teaching medical students about EHRs, um, how do you decide or kind of plan out the process of making the um, their experience as EHR agnostic as possible mm -hmm. to avoid them just becoming, mm -hmm. you know, when they're medical students at OHSU, they're going to become EPIC users and then force yeah. them even more down the road to say, I want to work at a residency that has EPIC mm -hmm. or be an attending at a place that has EPIC. How do you kind of think about the process of when you're designing their curriculum make it as EHR agnostic as possible. Sure. Now, yeah, that's that, that's a, a challenge. It's it's a challenge for the whole world, for the whole country, because um, almost all academic medical centers now are using EPIC. Um, the competencies are written very generically, and they're the kinds of things that you need to do, like trend labs, enter orders, use clinical decision support. Um, we try, I, I think we try, <laughs> to um, you, you know, to emphasize that, and oh, this is how it's done in Epic, and um, you know, unfortunately, especially in a city like this, when they go to Kaiser, when they go to an Ochin clinic, they're they're just using more Epic. Although, um, you know, the old adage, if you've seen one instance of Epic, you've seen one instance of Epic. Um, uh, but still, um, uh, it, it's important to to teach them the concepts. In fact, that's we. we tell the curricular leaders that, that, you know, that's one of the reasons why we want to teach the way that we do. So there, it, it isn't just about learning epic. <laughs> so I guess as a follow-up to that, has there been any discussion with the EHR vendors of potentially offering maybe an educational instance of their EHR so that an institution can have multiple versions without having to purchase the, you know, extended well, yeah. like a full kind of version of Cerner. We can just have an educational instance of Cerner so that OHSU has multiple options available. Is that kind of Yeah, I, um, I, I'm sure that question comes up. But, you know, I, I know that Epic's answer <laughs> to that is that, well, you, you know, if, if you're an Epic customer, you can do, you can do anything health professions, education related you want with Epic. We, we pay, actually pay Epic by the transaction. So um, it doesn't cost us anything. We, we have our virtual uh, server, uh, our virtual version of Epic, which actually you all have access to. 
Um, and it, it well, the, the, there's a cost to the department in that we have to pay for the server, but um, there's there's not a cost to OHSU. Um, I, I I don't know that the vendors would be that enthusiastic about it, but I, I don't know. I've I've never really been involved in those conversations. <laughs> or, or yeah, Aaron. Vendor, if you have the vendor's EHR in the clinical systems, like Bill was saying, they're pretty flexible about using it for education. But if you want another vendor's, <laughs> they're not so interested. I mean, I've had talks with Cerner about this, and they're not they're not interested in what they would like to do is sell you, you know, access to their educational instance or that platform or, or whatever. So they're also looking at it as a, as a way to make money. But if they already have a huge contract with the institute, and they tend to be a little bit more flexible. Epic started with us, and now they have, you know, fleshed out a whole program for using their EHRs in education. But you know, with their customers, I don't know specifically Epic's plans in terms of charging people who aren't their customers. Yeah, I, I don't. I do know that Cerner has created an online accessible version of their EHR to uh, to sell basically or sell seats for education. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Epic does not have any plan to uh, help other institutions who are not using Epic yeah. with any kind of educational process. They're, they send, send out a standard response of, this is something we're thinking about and we'll reach out when the time comes. And, and pretty soon, if you want hands-on with Cerner, you'll just be able to walk across the bridge. I was told by some folks from Portland VA that they actually may be the first instance of, of Cerner um, you, you know, Cerner signed the contract with the Department of Defense, and then um, the current administration uh, decided that it would make a lot of sense to um, have the VA using the same system as the Department of Defense. So the VA, uh, without really any kind of competitive bidding process, is is getting um, Cerner. Yeah, Mike. <laughs> I actually think it's very amazing, the whole online program that this department has created. Um, I have a question about the online part. Um, that as someone who does telemedicine <laughs> you know, research, I'm actually more and more thinking that there are some things that are difficult to, re to replicate you know, with my patients mm -hmm. remotely that I can do in person. And you know, I think we see that in the hybrid class, where I think that there are things that the students get out of being in person that they can't remotely. And you know, you know, people who do NIH grant reviews, you know, there's the in-person review versus the phone conference versus the, the uh, moderated discussion threads. And I personally believe that the in-person one is still sort of, there are things that are tough to do. And so I'm curious what your thoughts are about moving forward. Do you, do you um, and maybe this is a question for everybody, think that there are some areas that we could be doing to sort of better replicate something that's missing in the online part? Because I'm actually having trouble mm -hmm. figuring out what that is, but I know mm -hmm. you've thought about it. Well, I, um, you know, actually, um, similar to telemedicine, you, you know, we, we really shouldn't think of, of online necessarily as a replacement for face-to-face -face learning. And, and I agree. I mean, there, there, there still is nothing of, you know, especially, especially a, a real advanced student, like a PhD student. Uh, you know, that, that's why we actually, um, we occasionally talked about it, but we've never really seriously thought about putting a PhD program online. Because um, there is that sort of, you know, when you're in a mentor-mentee kind of relationship. Um, I'm sure there's probably things that that um, are, are missing, but, you know, it's just like, you know, again, telemedicine is not really meant to be a replacement for face-to-face -face care. It's meant to provide care when you can't, couldn't otherwise do it. Um, you know, so being out in a rural area or an elderly, infirm person who can't get out of their home and so forth. And so, um, uh, you know, I think that uh, for, for many people who would not be able to, to have informatics um, uh, education, this provides a way. Now, now that said, on, on the other hand, I'm thinking as I'm saying that, I just told you guys that we can't. Um, I mean, this is a phenomenon, certainly a phenomenon in the medical school. You know, they uh, record all the lectures, and a lot of the medical students choose to um, just watch them from the convenience of their own home, especially if they can double time them. Um, uh, and um, they, um, you know, it, it goes much faster. They don't have to come to campus. So, 
Um, so I don't know. That that is a that is a good question. But you know, I think that gets to um, it, it. You know, it, uh, online. We used to like completely separate. You know, you're either online or on campus, and that distinction has kind of gone away. So, um, so yeah, I think we need to think about how we can make it the learning experience better um, for you know remote people. Yeah, Dana. Thanks. I enjoyed the presentation. I had a question um, around the last bullet point. What else should faculty be thinking about? It's yeah. just an idea. Um, Ani mentioned like the access to electronic health records, and I was thinking about yeah, that's part of it. But then there's access to data as well, and there's access to de-identified data sets that you can look at from like you know ho other hospital settings. But we know in informatics that the organizational part and the data part. I mean, like the workflow and the data. It's you can't really separate the two, and if you study a de-identified data set, you don't have access to the work environment that's around that. Sure. So I think there's an opportunity to potentially provide access to work environments and data associated with those work environments on a concurrent basis, and it might be really foster some really exciting student projects. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I agree. You know, de-identified data loses the fidelity. That's the the project that well, Stephen Wu has uh, take uh, has, has moved on, but. That Stephen Bedrick and I are doing with um, NLP around um, patient records, um, and you know, but the, it's a challenge because it's highly personal data. We have I shouldn't even talk too much about it. A, a significant subset of of OHSU data on a highly secure server in the ACC. Um, that'll actually be a good question when the, the new chief information security officer comes. Um, and, uh, but you're absolutely right. Having, uh, you know, da data is everything now, and, and getting access to the data is really critical. And, and uh, we're, we're aware of that. <laughs> I think maybe we have time for one more question, or, or no more. Uh, okay. Well, very good. Thank you all, and um, we'll have another speaker next week, I guess. <laughs> <laughs>